Hello everyone, welcome to our very first video on the introduction to cancer biology. In the past 100 years or so, the scientific development in molecular biology and genetics have really improved our understanding of how cancer happens. The concept of Mendelian genetics and Darwin's theory of revolution have really revolutionized the way we study about cancer. So in our very first video here, um, I will try to take you through the implications of Mendelian genetics and Darwin's theory of evolution. And then we will link these ideas to casinogenesis, which is simply the formation of cancer. A lot of you may have already studied these ideas before, so this video really serves as a recap for everyone. Okay, first, let's talk about Mendelian genetics. Mendelian genetics basically refers to a set of rules that concern all organisms that reproduce sexually. By organisms, I refer to all multicellular animals and plants. Okay, so when we look at this cell, we can see in the nucleus, there are chromosomes, and then when we look more closely in the chromosome, we can see that the DNA actually intertwined with histone to form this structure called nucleosomes. The first implication about Mendelian genetics that I'm going to talk about is that the genotype of an organism is organized as thousands of discrete information packs in the DNA helix in the chromosome. The genotype of the organism is the set of genes in the DNA of a specific organism that we are talking about here. Or, let's put it in a more simple way, it is basically the genetic constituent of this organism. Meanwhile, the discrete information packs that I was talking about simply refers to the genes. The genes are usually found in a specific site along the length of an DNA in the chromosome. When we look at a single chromosome, it can contain up to thousands of genes. Almost all of the genes in the chromosome are involved in the development and maintenance of physiological processes, tissues, organs in this organism. That's why when we say that the genotype of an organism can determine the phenotype of that organism because the phenotype here basically refers to the observable traits or physical properties that we can see in the organism. Okay, so let's move on to the second implication of Mendelian genetics, which is that the higher organisms have genomes that are diploids. What do I mean by diploids? It means that the specific organisms that we are talking about here, when we look at their autosomes, there are two complete set of genes. The only exception here is the sex chromosomes. In sex chromosomes, there will be X and Y chromosomes, and they are presented in numbers that is appropriate for the sex of the individual. So, yep, as shown here, we have two sets of genes in a homologous chromosome. These two copies of genes do not always carry the same information. Sometimes they may even carry conflicting information. For example, one copy of the gene may code for blue eyes while the other may code for brown eyes. The different versions of the same gene are what we call alleles. When an organism contains two identical alleles, we say that the organism is homozygous with respect to the gene. If they contain two different alleles of a gene, the organism is said to be heterozygous with respect to the gene. So in this case, the organism is heterozygous with respect to the gene that codes for eye colors. As I said, the different alleles may contain conflicting information, then how do we decide which phenotype the organism may have? The alleles, they can be dominant or recessive. What I mean by this is that the phenotype encoded by the dominant allele will overrule the phenotype encoded by a recessive allele. This idea is actually very, very oversimplified. But at the moment, just let's just take that an allele can either be dominant or recessive. Okay, so let's look at an example here of a mother and a father. The mother has brown eyes and she is heterozygous because she has dominant alleles that codes for brown eyes and a recessive allele that codes for blue eyes. So she has 
brown eyes herself. While when we look at the father, the father has blue eyes because he is homozygous recessive. Because when we look at his genes, he's got two recessive alleles that codes for blue eyes. When we draw a Punnett square, we can see the likelihood of their offspring having blue eyes and brown eyes will be fifty fifty. Because capital B, which is the dominant allele that codes for brown eyes, it will sort of overrule the small capital B, which is the recessive allele. In our future video, we will also come across a term very, very frequently, and this term is wild type allele. This wild type allele is the allele that is present in the majority of apparently healthy organisms. So we believe that the、uh, wild type allele is responsible for. Normal structure and function within the specific organism that we are talking about. Next, I'm going to talk about、um, just briefly about Darwin's theory of evolution. So Charles Darwin proposed this concept of evolution. It mainly revolves around the idea of mutation and natural selection. When we talk about mutation here, we are really talking about the change in the nucleotide sequence in the DNA of a particular organism. The change in the nucleotide have the ability to convert one allele to the other, or even create a new allele that does not even exist in the genetic pool of that organism that we are talking about. And let's look at an example here. The mutation is this. Individual, which is represented by the blue dog, the mutation will be passed on to the next generation. The mutations that cause changes to the alleles, and this allele may actually give the organism certain survival or reproductive advantage phenotypes. While some mutations do not give rise to an allele that could possibly give the organism these advantages phenotype. So in the long run, natural selection will occur. We have to bear in mind that mutation can actually happen continuously throughout the lifetime of a species, and it can occur randomly as well. Meaning that the mutation can hit any nucleotide sequence in the DNA, both the coding and non-coding sequence. So the individual with advantageous phenotype will ultimately reproduce more offsprings than those without this advantageous phenotype, and. Those without this advantage phenotype will slowly die out. So the result of natural selection is really that the overall fitness of the species will ultimately improve, and the genotype that do not code for advantage phenotype will slowly be washed out from the gene pool. This idea of natural selection is also very important for cancer cells because cancer cells always have mutations that give them survival advantage. They must acquire this survival advantage before they can develop from a single cancer cell into a clinically visible tumor. The scientists have reviewed and concluded a set of characteristics that are shared by all cancer cells, and this set of characteristics allow cancer cells to progress from a single malignant cell into a clinically visible tumor as they provide competitive advantage to the cancer cells. And we call this set of characteristics the hallmarks of cancer. This will actually be one of our future topics. So do subscribe to our channel, and you can come back and learn about these hallmarks later. Okay, so let's come back to mutation, and I'm going to talk about two main type of mutations. First one is germline mutation. This mutation can be transmitted from one generation of an individual to its offspring, so its son, its daughter, and its grandkids will get it as well. The transmission of mutations through germline is made possible because the mutation hit a gene in the genome of a gamete, which refers to either an egg or a sperm, depending on the sex of the individual that we are talking about. The other mutation that I'm going to talk about is somatic mutation, which happens when the mutation hits the genome of cells anywhere else in the body, except for the gametes. Somatic mutation will not be transmitted to the sons, the daughters, or the grandkids of the individual that we are talking about. It will only affect this particular cell that the mutation hits, and this mutation will be passed on to the descendant cells of this mutant cell. 
When the mutant cell undergoes cell division, it will form daughter cells, and the daughter cell will have this somatic mutation as well. After many, many cell divisions, there will be thousands or millions of direct descendants of this single mutant cell. Together, we call all these cells a cell clone because everyone here can trace their ancestry directly back to that single mutant cell. After all the discussions about genetics and evolution, we have not really talked about cancer itself. So a lot of us may ask, what do genes and mutations got to do with cancer? Because we have very advanced biotechnology right now, which allows us to look at cells properly. So when we look at cancer cells, we realize that they have very very weird barren chromosomes. There may be an extra copy of chromosomes in the nucleus. The chromosomes may fuse with each other, or even worse, sometimes the chromosomes disappear entirely. As we mentioned before, mutation occurs when there is a genetic change in the organism. So any change in the structure or the number of chromosomes in a cell means that the cell is mutated. So really, by this definition, we are really saying that cancer cells are mutant cells. Next, let's explore the idea of euploidy and aneuploidy. In a normal healthy cell, when we look at its chromosome, each of the autosomes will have a normal structure, and they will exist in pairs. While the sex chromosome will have X and Y chromosomes that are present in the number that is appropriate for the sex of the individual that we are looking at. So the normal cells are really euploid. On the other hand, cancer cells are aneuploid, meaning that their chromosomes have a very different structure from that of the normal chromosomes in a healthy cell. This is because cancer cells are mutated; they are mutant cells. Earlier in the video, I mentioned that somatic mutation is very important in cancer formation because the descendant cells of the somatic mutant cell will form cell clones. Every member in the cell clones can trace. Their ancestry directly back to that single cell which the mutation originally hit. So nowadays, when we look at the cancer cells in most of the malignant tumors, we realize that most of the malignant tumor populations are monoclonal growths, meaning that all the cancer cells descended from a single cell that was hit by the mutation, and that's why they became cancerous. In other words, let's say a very rare genetic mutation happens in a gene that is associated with cancer. The chromosome of this mutant cell becomes barren. After some time, a clinically visible tumor is detected, and when we look at the cells in this tumor mass, the particular abnormality in the chromosome can be seen in all the cancer cells within this tumor mass. One of the evidence that proves cancer cells are of monoclonal growth comes from multiple myeloma, which is a cancer that concerns the antibody-producing plasma cells in the blood. Normally, a healthy person has millions of distinct plasma cells in his body, each having his own distinct antibody molecules. But when we look at the plasma cells in a multiple myeloma patient, what we see is that all the myeloma cells in that specific patient, they have the same antibody molecules on them. This really proves that cancerous myeloma cells come from the same ancestor cells. So I guess that's all for our very first video. We talk about how Mendelian genetics help to explain the idea of mutation and how cancer cells are mutant cells. In the next video, we will look more closely on how mutations in cells can actually lead to cancer itself. Thanks, everyone. Hope you guys enjoy our very first video made by Penfei, Kevin, and Liana. Thank you very much, and remember to subscribe to our channel.